Hello everyone, this is Michele Colo with Campus Clarity again. It is now uh, almost 11 a.m., so we'll be kicking off uh, the event very soon. Um, I wanted to start with only a couple of housekeeping items for you folks that uh, may be not so familiar with the GoToWebinar platform. Um, as you can see, there is a question mark at the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, that's where you can type in your questions. Um, uh, this event is designed to be rather short, so to be respectful of everybody's time, we'll probably have to get back to your questions after the event, but by all means, feel free to uh, put them in. And uh, speaking of the question box, now, if you can hear us, could you please type uh, audio OK so that we know that uh, the audio is working fine? Okay, and uh, the slides for this uh, presentation will be made available as a handout at the end of, of the event, and uh, they will appear on the right-hand side of your screen. I will, I will uh, explain where, where you can get them. Um, with that, um, it is now 11.01. I see that a lot of people are, are still joining, but... Um, uh, I'll start uh, with a little introduction on our webinar today. As you know, it's about the OCR guidelines and in particular uh, the precious takeaways that uh, the recent uh, Department of Education, Office of Civil Rights uh, and the University of Virginia investigation as well as the subsequent resolution agreement can offer to Title IX institutions. Presenting on this topic today are Karen Peterson and Christine Day, uh, legal editors here at Campus Clarity. Uh, thanks to both of you for being here today. Uh, give a brief overview on both your backgrounds and then, and then we can start. Karen is a California attorney. At Campus Clarity, she specializes in higher education law and campus safety issues. Prior to joining our editorial team, she spent several years in private legal practice. Karen heard earned her BA from UC Berkeley and JD from the University of San Francisco Law School. Christine is also a California attorney. At Campus Clarity, she specializes in employment law, tracking case law, and legislative regulatory updates. Prior to joining our legal team, she, works, she worked in legal publishing, research, and writing in the fields of tax, business, and employment law. Christine earned her BA from the University of Southern California and JD from the University of San Diego Law School. Now, without further ado, let's hand the discussion to our presenters so we can dive into the, today's topic. Thank you again for being here, and to you, Karen. Thank you, Michele, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I'm Karen Peterson, and today we'll cover Title IX basics uh, for building a framework to conduct an internal compliance review. And to build this framework, we've taken five building blocks from the Office for Civil Rights' most recent letter of findings that it issued after its investigation of the University of Virginia, which gives us insight into how the OCR interprets its guidance for compliance purposes. And using this real case study, we hope to help others avoid some of the Title IX violations that, that the OCR identified at UVA. Uh, my colleague Chris Day will tell you about recent legislation and how it aligns with the OCR, with the OCR, and how it determined that UVA needed to do things differently to achieve Title IX compliance. So let's get started. Um, first, the five Title IX basics we'll talk about are Title IX coordinators, Title IX policies grievance procedures, campus climate surveys, and prevention programs. Um, what the OCR's letter of findings tells us is that it's not enough to simply have these in place because impl implementation is how schools um, often run afoul of the Title IX requirements. Um, so, the Title IX coordinator, the OCR reminded us in its April 2015 Dear Colleague letter that school districts, colleges, and universities that receive federal funds must have a Title IX coordinator who addresses sexual harassment and violence complaints and coordinates and oversees Title IX compliance. Um, 
I want to note that schools must have at least one Title IX coordinator at all times, so the, the position should not be left vacant, and that sometimes requires that an interim Title IX coordinator um, fill this role. And for Title IX coordinators to be effective, they must have the uh, training, uh, authority, and independence. Uh, regular training keeps Title IX coordinators current on Title IX developments, as well as other federal and state laws that over, overlap with Title IX. For example, FERPA and reporting requirements under the Clery Act. Um, they also need the appropriate authority and support. Uh, the Dear Colleague letter says this means Title IX coordinators should report directly to senior leadership and be visible in their communities. They also need independence from other job duties. Um, this avoids conflicts of interest. For example, designating a general counsel or a dean of students um, or an athletics director as a Title IX coordinator, coordinator uh, may pose a conflict of interest. And then at the same time that the OCR issued its Dear Colleague letter on Title IX coordinators, it also provided a resource guide that spells out the Title IX coordinator's duties. They should coordinate compliance with Title IX, coordinate responses to all complaints of possible sex, sex discrimination, and that includes sexual harassment and sexual violence monitor outcomes, and identify patterns of and uh, systemic problems. And it's also critical that um, the Title IX policies um, are in place and the OCR recommends that the Title IX coordinator should be involved in drafting the school's Title IX policies and procedures. And this can make sure that they comply with Title IX, define prohibited behavior consistently across related policies, and encourage reporting. Um, this assures community members that the institution's response will be uh, prompt and equitable. Um, this is a common theme throughout Title IX compliance, prompt and equitable. Um, and so we'll be uh, focusing on that theme throughout the presentation. Um, the OCR also emphasizes the importance of posting on a school's website a statement of non-discrimination, which is required by Title IX regulations. And that included with that should be contact information for Title IX coordinators and links to the schools, policies, and procedures. And if you look on the University of Virginia's homepage, you'll notice at the bottom there's a direct link to the non-discrimination uh, notice. Um, and this uh, goes directly to the school's uh, Title IX policies and uh, with contact information for Title IX coordinators. There's also a link to the OCR's model statement of non-discrimination in the resources at the end of these slides, which will uh, be available to you um, after the webinar. Uh, an important uh, part of the Title IX policies is to uh, define prohibited conduct. Um, and these definitions should be applied consistently, whether the perpetrator is a student, an employee, or a third party. Um, and the types of prohibited conduct that should be included are sexual or gender-based harassment or violence. And this would include um, sexual assault, uh, sexual contact, uh, sexual coercion, and included in that definition should be, you should define consent and explain the difference between intoxicated and incapacitated. In many state laws, what we find is that um, incapacitated means that a person is, um, is under the influence of drugs of, and, or alcohol to the point that they do not understand the um, nature or consequences of the conduct. 
um, which renders them incapable of consenting to sexual activity. Uh, you should also include definitions of dating and domestic violence and stalking. And I also want to point out that Title IX policies must also prohibit discrimination against pregnant and parenting students, as well as retaliation. Um, some experts feel that a uh, separate policy against retaliation is important because uh, retaliation can be a bigger problem than discrimination. Um, also, explaining how your policies relate to each other and when each applies is important. Uh, avoid overlapping and conflicting policies. Avoid inconsistent and confusing terminology. In other words, avoid legalese. Uh, the OCR wants the Title IX coordinators to be involved in the drafting process because a lot of times um, uh, lawyers get involved and we, we tend to uh, favor legalese and um, Title IX coordinators can make sure that these policies are framed in uh, easily understood terms. Now I'm going to hand it over to Chris uh, to talk about recent legislation. Hi. Four states require affirmative consent policies. California and New York provide definitions of affirmative consent, and Illinois and Connecticut, where an affirmative consent law was signed by the governor last week, provide that schools may choose an affirmative consent definition that meets a minimum standard. This is a list of states that have recently tried to pass affirmative consent legislation or that are considering it. Iowa, Kansas, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia have introduced bills and Hawaii and New Jersey have formed task forces to study the issue. So if you're in one of these states, just be aware that it's a subject that your legislature is thinking about. The Federal Campus Accountability and Safety Act, or CASA, is a bill that has bipartisan support in the US Senate, but it hasn't made it out of committee for a vote. Its sponsors are hoping now to attach it to the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. CASA would require schools to disclose the number of assaults reported to their Title IX coordinator and the outcomes of those cases, which is something that schools haven't been willing to do. CASA would also require schools to provide confidential advisors for non-employee victims, amnesty for nonviolent student conduct violations, such as underage drinking, that are revealed in the course of making a report, and uniform disciplinary procedures. CASA would also increase the penalties for the Clery Act and Title IX violations. So I think that makes clear that it's important to review uh, Title IX policies at least annually and sooner if new laws require changes. So after defining prohibited conduct, uh, Title IX policies must also explain what happens when someone files a complaint against a student, employee, or third party alleging sexual harassment or violence or other prohibited conduct. And there's a great, great quote in the uh, OCR letter of findings that the procedures for um, addressing and resolving complaints of sexual harassment should be written in language that is easily understood, should be easily located, and should be widely distributed. And I think those are um, good guidelines to keep in mind. So there are three steps involved in grievance procedures, reporting options, investigation, and adjudication. Under reporting options, um, basically there are uh, three options. Um, the first is a non-confidential report. Uh, this is a report made to a Title IX coordinator. Uh, a, res a responsible employee, and that's someone who is required to report information about possible sexual harassment or violence to the Title IX co coordinator. And it also includes a report to uh, local law enforcement. Uh, this triggers the Title IX investigation, and for Title IX coordinators, uh, it also uh, triggers the uh, obligation to um, offer interim protective measures to the victim. Um, 
it should also be pointed out that uh, to the victim that a police report is not required, but that the school will assist the victim if requested. Uh, second option is confidential uh, reporting. Um, this would involve a disclosure to a mental health counselor, pastoral counselors, social workers, or another person whose professional license requires confidentiality. Also, the OCR's question and answer document uh, that was issued back in April of 2015 suggested that schools could also designate non-professional counselors and advocates as confidential sources. And this wouldn't trigger um, a requirement that the uh, information be re reported to the Title IX investigator but it would require that non-identifying information be reported to a campus security authority so it could be included in the school's Clery Act um, annual security report. So again, confidential or anonymous reports do not trigger a Title IX investigation. And then a third option would be online reporting. Um, providing an online reporting option could be either non-confidential or anonymous or both. And a report or a disclosure of information should always um, uh, trigger a, a duty to provide information about on and off campus resources where a victim can find uh, support and services. And now Chris has more recent legislation updates. Here are some details about recent state legislation. In general, states are requiring the schools to provide online and anonymous reporting options and to offer amnesty for student code violations that are disclosed in the course of reporting. New York's law also allows this amnesty for bystanders who disclose incidents. So the second step in the grievance process is an investigation. OCR says it should be a prompt, thorough, and impartial inquiry, and that the school should provide both parties with periodic updates on the status of the investigation. So um, a bit about investigation techniques in-person interviews of both parties should be conducted and interviewers should be trained on trauma-informed uh, methods of interviewing victims. Um, investigators uh, need to know the effects of trauma to better understand how it affects the brain and how not to re-traumatize a witness. There's an excellent uh, presentation uh, that was given by Dr. Rebecca Campbell and um, the neuro neurobiology of trauma, and there's a link to that uh, presentation in the resources, and I would, I would recommend it to you if you haven't already seen it. Other uh, investigation techniques should include identifying and interviewing other witnesses to provide independent accounts of what happened and identify corroborating evidence. Uh, one example that the OCR brought out was that um, looking on social media, uncovered a video of an incident. Um, so you shouldn't simply be relying on the two parties to uh, present uh, evidence and witnesses, but uh, the school should be conducting its own uh, independent investigation. Um, and just a, another uh, note on in-person interviews, it allows uh, it not only allows both parties to pro provide their own accounts of what occurred, but it gives the investigators the opportunity to uh, gather information um, and assess each person's credibility and reliability. Other best practices uh, around investigations. Uh, you should be coordinating with other ongoing school or criminal investigations, sharing information, um, avoid duplic duplicate efforts and also uh, 
co uh, coordinating with criminal investigations can avoid subjecting victims to multiple in, uh, interviews. Also, the school should keep full and accurate records of all complaints. That, that helps identify repeat offenders and examine patterns of sexual harassment um, and violence that might be occurring uh, in your community. And now Chris has more legislative updates. Connecticut's law requires schools to disclose a summary of their investigation and disciplinary procedures. And under Illinois' law, neither the complainant nor the respondent can be compelled to testify in the presence of the other party. If one party invokes this right, the school must have a procedure to allow each party at a minimum to hear the other party's testimony. So the third step in the grievance process is the adjudication. Um, and there are uh, three models, the most common uh, being single investigator, administrative or panel hearing, or a hybrid of the hearing and uh, single investigator models. Um, and it's which, which model works best uh, for your institution doesn't depend on the school's resources and support uh, or it does depend on the school's resources and, and support not on Title IX because um, determining the most appropriate model uh, is, is something that will be unique to your uh, school's needs and um, resources. But the two requirements that apply to all procedures is, is again, they must be prompt and equitable. And while the OCR has stated that typical cases should only take 60 days to investigate and resolve, uh, the OCR has also said that it doesn't require uh, schools to revolve, resolve all cases in 60 days um, because they depend on the complexity of the case and whether a criminal investigation requires delays. Uh, the critical elements of the adjudication process as uh, set forth by the OCR are um, explain the process, including how to file a complaint, address complaints against employees, students, and third parties, so that the person um, looking at your uh, grievance procedures can identify which, which uh, process is going to apply to them. Designate prompt time frames for major stages of the complaint process, but again, uh, these would be guidelines and not necessarily hard uh, deadlines because uh, each case will be unique. And then make sure that your procedures provide both parties with an opportunity to present witnesses and other evidence, um, written notice of the outcome and any right to appeal and applies a preponderance of evidence standard. Uh, identifies potential remedies and sanctions. And also identifies sources of counseling, advocacy, and support for the parties. Um, you can find uh, these elements also in the OCR's question and answer document that I referenced earlier, and again, there's a link in the resources to that document. And I also want to mention due process since it's been such a hot topic and subject of lawsuits here recently. Um, I wanted to clarify that due process in school grievance proceedings guarantees students attending public institutions uh, the right to written notice of the allegations and evidence, and a fair opportunity to present the student's position and evidence. Uh, these are different than the due process required in a criminal trial. Um, a federal district court recently ruled that a student accused of sexual assault was denied due process in a disciplinary proceeding when the hearing panel's decision were, was reversed on appeal based on conduct that wasn't included in the original notice of charges. So if there were new charges that were, were raised at some point in the process, you would need to go back 
and um, start the process from the beginning again so that these notice requirements have been satisfied. Also, the OCR has been clear that in campus sexual assault hearings, um, allowing the accused to directly confront the accuser can cause more harm to the victim. So if, if the victim requested that uh, both parties aren't present in the same room at the same time, uh, the OCR suggests an alternative is to use closed circuit TV or another, other means to allow each party to evaluate, evaluate the other party's testimony, but not necessarily have them sitting across the table from each other. Um, OCR also says, if, the grievance, if your grievance procedures protect Title IX rights and due process, they will lead to sound and supportable decisions. So that takes us to uh, another problem area in grievance procedures, which is conflicts of interest. Um, the OCR found in, the, in its uh, UVA investigation that there was an appearance of a conflict of interest when one of the key individuals in the panel hearing process uh, performed Title IX coordinator functions, selected a hearing panel, decided what evidence would be admitted at the hearing, wrote the first draft of the decision letter, and then also defended the, the panel's decision on appeal. So this is just an example to um, make sure that you understand you need to be careful to avoid having persons who decide these cases serving in conflicting roles. Finally, um, grievance procedures uh, with the sanctions, you need to make sure that the discipline policies treat similar, similarly situated students the same, that you keep and maintain records to monitor sanctions to ensure that you're having this consistent application of sanctions. Um, and then consider broader remedies if they're needed to address the effects of harassment, um, not just uh, the, as it affects the victim, but also as it affects the broader campus community. So again, with sanctions, consistent application is, is the critical point. I just want to also briefly touch on campus climate surveys because they can be such an important um, source of information. They can inform your policies, procedures, and prevention programs, identify barriers to reporting, and gather data for allocating your precious resources. And then some information and act, action items that you can take away from these surveys. Um, and also, I want to note that the OCR says that Title IX coordinators should help develop the campus climate, climate surveys to evaluate discriminatory attitudes, harassment, or other problematic behaviors, such as where they happen, who is responsible, and who is targeted, and then how to best address these issues. And in the resources, there is a link to uh, notalone.gov, which has a sample campus climate survey. Um, and then how to, ways to best address these issues uh, as far as action items go, uh, increase safety measures, and take other pro proactive steps. And then finally, prevention program, which is something that we deal a lot with here at Campus Clarity. Uh, we just want to remind you that training is required for both students and faculty and staff. And once again, OCR recommends that Title IX coordinators should also be involved in uh, training the campus community on uh, Title IX rights and how to file a complaint. And if you look at the question and answer document in Section J, they have a list of training requirements for both students and faculty and staff. Um, all employees should also be trained on how to respond to reports of sexual violence. 
including how to use non-judgmental language and explain the employee's reporting all obligation, and then also be trained on the impact of trauma on victims. Student training should be rep repeated at regular intervals and be designed to help students retain the information and, and encourage them to report, um, including uh, information on how to make a confidential disclosure. Um, and again, that question and answer document will give you a list of, of training requirements for students. And we also have a link to the VAWA final regulations in our resources, which um, lays out the training requirements uh, that were enacted under the Clery Act amendments contained in the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act. So in conclusion, um, you know, by looking at the numbers, uh, uh, as of May 1st in 2014, there were 55 colleges and universities under Title IX investigation. As of June 2nd, 2016, last week, there were 192. So as these numbers indicate, um, the OCR investigations are multiplying rapidly. And hopefully the basics of Title IX compliance will help you address and prevent sexual harassment and violence in your campus community. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. Uh, we hope you found this information helpful. And we appreciate your time and, and attention to this difficult and important work. Thank you, Karen. And thank you, Christine. That was uh, awesome. So uh, I'm sure many of our attendees today, we have had about 200 schools uh, on the line with us will find these takeaways useful and applicable to their institutional context. I think the complexity of the topics we touched upon speaks um, to the breadth of the Title IX and Campus Save requirements for schools. And uh, that, as we've seen, are not only substantiated in federal and state law, but can also uh, be derived, as we saw extensively today, from OCR decisions. Um, as it's flashing right now on the screen, you can see that the slides contain a number of resources that we've compiled for you um, regarding these topics. And um, these are my contacts. If you need to contact me after this event, I'll be happy to answer all your questions. Um, I want to let everybody know that the slides are now available. Um, if you look at the right-hand side under the question mark, there should be an icon that represents a document. Uh, please click on it, and from there you can download the slides of this presentation with the resources and with my contacts. Um, as always, if you're familiar with our webinars, we'll be also mailing out a recording of the event uh, with a couple of follow-up items to um, provide more context around these topics. Uh, lastly, for those of you who are uh, listening still and have not had a chance to take a look at our training, but would like to receive a demo of our courses and online training platform, if you can just type demo in the question box, uh, the one you were using to ask questions during the webinar, uh, again, that's on the right-hand side of your screen, we'll have one of our training experts reach out to you and uh, show you around. Uh, the webinar is now finished. We're finished on time. Congratulations to our presenters, and thanks to all of you for uh, being with us. Um,